Welcome to Garden DC, the podcast about everything gardening in the Washington DC and Mid-Atlantic region. I'm your host, Kathy Jentz. I'm the editor of Washington Gardener Magazine, and we're aimed at gardening enthusiasts, people who grow everything from edibles to ornamentals, natives to exotics. If it grows in our area, that's what we talk about. episode of Garden DC, we're joined by Terry Spate. She is the visionary behind Cottage in the Court. She's a garden speaker, a garden writer, a blogger, and all-around garden whisperer. Welcome, Terry. Hi, Kathy. How are you? Good. How about you? I'm good. I'm in a good place today. Good. I was going to expect you to answer hot. (laughs) because <laughs> uh, the Garden DC podcast took a couple weeks break during the height of summer so we could catch up on some projects. And what we've been experiencing mostly is just that typical Washington DC July heat and humidity. How has it been for you? Oh, pretty much the same. I've, I've been inside a lot. Um, mm-hmm. But, you know, we expect this every year. It'll be like this until the end of August. So we just have to pick our moments to enjoy the garden. First, I want to talk a little bit about you, Terry. So I like to ask, were you born with chlorophyll in your veins? Did you come out with a green thumb or two green thumbs? How did you start into gardening? Well, uh, first of all, I'm a native Washingtonian. Shout out to Riggs Park, Northeast DC. And I went to LaSalle Elementary and uh Then we moved to Burtonsville in the 70s. And my dad, uh, and my, well, actually both of my parents uh, taught uh, all of us to garden. I was probably the one that appreciated it the most. There was my mom, we planted uh, celosia, which she would say was coxcomb, uh, and um, portulaca. That was our thing every year. And my dad had planted my mom a rose garden. And so she taught us how to appreciate roses, cut roses. We always had uh, bouquets of flowers in the house. And then my dad would always allow me to sit and watch because I was a girl. Uh, As he and my brother dug holes and gardened. And all I can remember is just sitting on the porch going, one day, I'm going to dig my own garden. And And I have. Um, my career path, I have, I'm a mom, uh, I'm a grandmother. Uh, when my girls were growing up, I was head gardener for the city of Fredericksburg. Uh, I became a master gardener in Fredericksburg. Shout out to Central Rappahannock Master Gardeners. Um, and I've always just, you know, been in love with the earth. I collect rocks for no odd reason. When uh, I wanted to be an archeologist and a fashion designer in Paris, go figure. But now I'm writing about gardening. I'm teaching people to garden. I'm advising people on appreciating their green space. Um, So did I come out with green hands? I think so, because I just can't think of anything other that anyone would want to do in their life other than garden. Hmm. Well, it sounds like you had both nature and nurture in your background coming from a a family of gardeners. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. My, my dad was really, um, we, I grow a lot of hydrangeas because that was, that was like our signature flower. It should be on my family crest, but my dad would always go through these, you know, rituals with his hydrangeas. And, uh, we grew up having a spoma in the house. Um, we really, we were outdoors people, to be uh, quite honest. I think we were the only people that were that would uh, go down to Luray Caverns as a family. And we would walk in nature and talk about nature. My dad would talk about the earth and how we should be kind to it. So that's just how I was raised. Hmm. And people who are grown up in the D.C. area or have traveled to our area and haven't gone to Luray, you need to go. 
<laughs> so, yes. Especially in the summer because it is so literally cool, like temperature mm-hmm. cool, right yep. below the earth's surface down there. Yeah. But if you're at all claustrophobic, probably not for you. Well, probably probably not. not so much. No. But but <laughs> but you know, right here in DC, I remember we would leave church on Sundays and go to uh I think it was Eddie Long sandwich. We would get like this foot long sandwich. My dad would cut it up and we would go right to Rock Creek Park. That was, they were the best times. We always found a place right near the water and we just like had family time there. So we, we literally grew up appreciating all the gifts that nature has. Hmm. That sounds a lot like my upbringing where my parents would take us out to Catuctan mountains or, you know, we would drive to somewhere in the country every Saturday. And not that I was always a willing participant, Terry, (laughs) I have to admit that I was more with my nose in my book than interested in the, the natural surroundings that they took me to, but Mm -hmm. you know, it, it it seeps in, right. It seeps in. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. We, we used to hate going to, I mean, because it was three toddlers and, and then an infant, because my younger brother's eight years younger than me. We would, my dad would have to go to Longwood Gardens um, for work. He worked at the Smithsonian. And um, we just thought that was the worst vacation ever. That was our vacation. And we just were like, really? And now I think to myself, we should have appreciated those times. <laughs> You are so spoiled. (laughs) (laughs) I know. (laughs) Because Longwood Gardens, you know, that is a mecca for so many gardeners, uh, not just on the East Coast, but around the world. You know, it has a worldwide reputation of excellence, of course. But yeah, I could see, you know, for little kids you know, it's not your, your cup of tea. You want right. to, you know, now there's more of a children's garden there and more maybe of interest for little kids. Yeah. But yeah. And then of course the, the fountain show with the music, right. I mean, right. that's for everybody. That's not yeah. just for plant nerds, yeah. but yeah, I can see <laughs> that, you know, yeah. some things we grow into some interests we get exposed yeah. to and come back to later in life. So yeah. that does bring up your children and grandchildren. Are yeah. they gardeners? My, my oldest daughter and my grandsons are, they're beginning to garden. My, uh, she lives in an apartment, so she has her little veggie garden on her balcony. My youngest daughter lives in Adams Morgan, and she has the bug. She is a gardener. Yeah. The other day it was uh, cloudy and about to rain, and she sent me a text saying, I'm digging up that root I've been working on. I'm like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Let the rain soften the soil and just go at it, go for it. And she did, but then she she couldn't finish it. But she did, you know, we are gardeners through and through. Um, It's in our blood. And so I imagine you're passing along a lot of plants from your garden to her garden. Yes, she does a lot with produce, um, which when I lived in Fredericksburg, I was a founding farmer of the IT CSA and I remember her really by my side. My oldest daughter has never been into bugs, but my youngest daughter, she would be by my side when we would pick the bugs off of the squash and put it in soapy water. She understood kelp. She understood, you know, using seaweed as a fertilizer. She got it. You know, we used uh, uh, non-print newspaper from the Freelance Star when that was in business. So, uh, Thea remembers all that kind of stuff. My oldest daughter was like, eh, it's just a little too buggy for me. The boys, uh, my oldest grandson used to really be into it. Uh, the youngest one definitely appreciates the harvest. Hmm. So he's more on the foodie side of things. Yeah, he's more of a foodie. Yeah. So the other oldest one is 17. So mm-hmm. he's engrolled them right now. Yeah, I was going to say he'll come back to it. <laughs> He will. <laughs> He'll come back around. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about your home garden currently. So you've dubbed it Cottage in the Court. Can you describe that court and what your garden is surrounded with and then what you grow in your garden? Well, first of all, I have no turf. Uh, I have a garden. My front yard is a meadow. 
uh, mostly perennials. I did add annuals this year because uh, I wanted year long color, but you know, um, they're there. Uh, there's zinnias and there's cosmos. The cosmos hasn't really kicked in yet. It's tall enough and it's in bud, but you know, a perennial meadow with a few annuals thrown in allows the eye moments to rest. So I've got pockets of daylilies blooming, pockets of phlox, pockets of echnacea. The lavender is done, the yarrow. I need to cut that back so I get a second flush. Um, my nepeta, I've got to cut that back so I can get a second flush and maybe even a third. I am okay with a garden not in continuous bloom because just like humans, we're not always uber happy. There's some days that we're just kind of mellow. Some days where we really just want to kind of go hide. The garden is just like a human. So if you were approaching my house right now, on the left, there's a bright red hibiscus because the nepeta needs to be cut back. By the time the hibiscus stops, the nepeta will be blooming again. The daylilies are done. The mums are coming up. So it's like a symphony. And that's exactly how I've planted it. I don't want, I don't ever want a formal traditional garden. I love a garden that says, look at me. I am unique. There's a lot of diversity going on in here. And we're just going to sing to the owner, which is me. And it does. There's birds, there's butterflies, there's bumblebees. It's craziness out there. So I'm kind of in the middle of a cul-de-sac with a little explosion of color going on. How do your neighbors feel about your little cottage in, in the court? Are they turf grass people? A pretty one, one is turf grass um, on one side, turf grass and statuary. The other side is kind of, she is beginning to garden more. She does a lot of food gardening um, in her front under uh, screening and stuff. So, um, but you know, to each his own and she is elderly. So she does have a lot of raised containers. Uh, I pretty much have my food in the back. And this year I uh, went back to my community garden and doing most of my food there uh, because I found out in the midst of our uh, unintentional pausing period, I had vegetables on my terrace. My terrace is where I go to sit, read, and relax. It's quiet back there. With the vegetables back there, I was always harvesting. I was always doing something. So I never really rested in my garden. So this year, I moved the, the produce out. And now I can sit on my terrace again and just breathe. That's a good point that yeah you want to place seating in the garden where it will be most restful for your spirit and your eyes so you don't feel like you have to get up every five seconds and you're like oh that's a weed oh mm -hmm. you know that's that needs to be plucked um so that's a, a great point mm -hmm. and i know you work full time mm -hmm. uh in addition to everything else you're doing but I wanted to ask for our listeners who probably are working full-time, a lot of them too, um, how you squeeze in gardening with all your writing, your consulting and speaking and blogging. You know, Kathy, um, it's not easy. I will tell you that. But if you are passionate about something, you will find the time. And the way I do it, uh, I plant closely, so my front yard, honestly, the weeds are only along the edges. I weeded my garden for the year, and you know, we've been a little busy this year, Kathy, but I weeded my garden for the year the other day, and it took me 10 minutes. Oh, wow. And the reason why is because I plant closely, so if you do not leave spaces for weeds to go, oh, there's a spot. They have nowhere to land. They're not going to grow. 
So those weeds will go in my compost. There was nothing invasive in it. So they'll go in my compost and uh, it'll be put back into the garden at some point, six months from now, next spring. I'm a, I'm a slow compost girl. So, you know, I'm in no rush. Hmm. And Terry's alluded to a project that she and I were working on for the last six months. And so we're finally allowed to tell everybody about it. <laughs> we, were, we were sworn to secrecy by the book publisher. So uh, it is now available for pre-order on Amazon.com. And the title of the book that we have co-written is The Urban Garden, 101 Ways to Grow Food and Beauty in the City. Um, so we'll have a link to that in the podcast notes as well. So you can check that out. But we're super excited, super exhausted. I don't know what other adjectives I can use for it, Terry. How about you? Um, I think you I think you you pretty much pegged it. I I am kind of in a state of disbelief because A, the book is long overdue. And B, I think it's a gift of love to all the people that are beginning to garden today. True. And I've been asked so many times about small space and urban gardening, and there's just not that much out there. There, you know, there might be a tip here or there in a magazine article, mm -hmm. but there's not really many compilations that address small space gardening concerns. Right. And when you think about it, so many people, they've got condos or they're in a townhouse and they want to maximize the beauty in the space allowed. So many people will say, you know, I just have a postage stamp yard. And I'm thinking, postage stamp, is it a square or a rectangle? <laughs> <laughs> you want food or you want beauty or you want to mix it up, you know? Yeah, and I recall years ago having a booth at the Washington Home and Garden Show at the convention center, and every third person or so who would come by would be like, oh, I wish I could garden, but I have no space. And I would start to ask them, you know, well, where do you live? What type of place do you live in? And invariably, they had space. I would get, mm -hmm. I would get it out of them. I was like, "Oh, you're in a townhouse. You could do this, this, and this. Oh, you're in an HOA. You can do this. Uh, rooftop gardening or getting a community garden. Um, you know." So we would always talk through their ways that they could find space to garden. So right. I would think that a lot of people, you know, there's the space barrier is more in your life almost, and that's why I was asking you how you find time to garden. Um, because it's making space in your life almost more than making the space in your actual physical area. Right, right. Once again, if you really want to do something, you will find the time. I, I honestly spend more time enjoying my garden than working in it, whether it's early in the morning. I do not leave to go to work without walking through my garden. Now, granted, I'm up at five o'clock in the morning, but that's beside <laughs> the point. It, to me, it sets the tone for the rest of the day. Doesn't matter if it's winter, spring, summer, or fall. I do not leave my property to go to work until I have walked around it. And that's just walking down the side, across the terrace, up the other side to my car. It sets the tone. And if it's light in the evening, I come home and I do the same thing. Usually Precious is with me, my dog, but it just really makes you take notice of what's happening now. Um, can I cut a bloom to bring inside and put in a vase? Uh, should I cut those off? Should I deadhead? Should I let the seeds drop? So many things cross my mind, but if you don't go out and enjoy it, what's the point? definitely something to think about. And I will point out for our book, The Urban Garden, that we're talking about both food and beauty growing, mm -hmm. um, which I think both Terry and I feel super strong about that. A lot of urban gardening um, YouTube channels or influencers or blogs or articles when they talk about urban gardening, they just mean urban farms or they just mean food growing and how to produce food in the city. 
but I think that beauty part of it, that ornamental mm. garden has been mm. kind of lacking when talking about urban gardening. Yep. yep. And the thing about it, the ornamental things that you can grow in the garden, that's where the excitement of gardening happens. I mean, like the crepe myrtles are, are, are in bloom right now. I have rocket red and it just opened up today. Well, this morning it was in bud. At the same time, I must confess because I really love fairy tale eggplant. It's just the cutest thing. <laughs> I do have a couple of those in the mix in the garden, but I've got these little purple, beautiful little tiny eggplants. And then bam, this red bloom of the crepe myrtle. If you mix it up, which is a tip I'd like to share with people, diversify your garden. Mix it up. You don't have to do one or the other. You can mix it up. You can do a tomato in a pot in the midst of some rutabecchia and ignatia. You know, I, there's just so many ways that you can mix it up. And because you have a small space, doesn't necessarily mean you have to do one or the other. And be creative. Be unique in your thought patterns because it's your space. You can do what you want in it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, those that, those examples that you mentioned, tomatoes right side by side with echinacea, coneflower, or black-eyed Susan, those are all sun-loving plants. So if you only have a little bit of sunshine, you know, facing pro on your property or on your deck or balcony, you know, you want to put them cheek by jowl in any case so they can get as much sun as possible to produce both the flowers and the vegetables. Mm -hmm. And just think, you go out and you pick that tomato and you might just decide, you know what, I think I'll make a bouquet. And you might pick some of that rudbeckia. You might cut some of that echinacea. And while you're enjoying your salad or your tomato, you can think to yourself, this all came from my hands and my earth. Lovely. And I do want to make a shout out to the fairy tale eggplant that you mentioned earlier. Because <laughs> <laughs> that is one of the, I don't want to call it a new vegetable, but one of a new series of vegetables that are being mm -hmm. bred specifically for small size gardens. Um, so you might look out in garden seed catalogs or in mail order or online or in your local garden center for, um, sometimes it'll say patio sized, which I think, mm -hmm. you know, that, that is more from Chicago Midwest terminology where they'll mm -hmm. call it a patio. So you'll see patio sized vegetables sometimes referred to, or sometimes it will say container sized or container grown vegetables. So the mm -hmm. plant itself is smaller and doesn't go crazy in your containers. And then the fruit or vegetable you're going to get is also a little smaller and perfect, you know, between you and I, Terry, perfect for the single person for cooking for yourself. Amen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and if you want more, and, just plant more. And sharing. I was going to say and sharing because when they're prolific, then, the, then you start the sharing. <laughs> But yeah. I love the the little purple flowers first on the eggplant and then the fruit. And there's yeah. another one that I've enjoyed growing this past year. It's called Gretel. Um, so like Hansel and Gretel. Uh, and that's yeah. a little white slender one. Um, so you get the same plant, same flower, but just a little thinner and different shade. Yeah. Same taste, of yeah. course. Same if you're if you're yeah. an eggplant fan like both of us are. <laughs> And I know not everybody is. Yep. That's true. But the, but the thing about it, when you have Gretel, which is long white and hangs down, and then you've got the fairy tale, which is purple striped, usually it's variegated, and it maxes out in size about two inches. But think of that in the garden. What could you plant behind that that would make harvesting a pleasure in a small space you're going to see most things up close and personal. So why not broaden that experience to mix and mingle? You know, I'm crazy that way, Kathy. <laughs> well, I think, yeah, there's the old school of gardening where you plant in rows and you keep things separated. It makes weeding a little easier, but 
that actually, even though that's called traditional farming or traditional gardening, to do it that way, to have, you know, lots of mulch around each plant, each plant is separated. Um, that's only actually been around in the last 100, 150 years. Before that, mm-hmm. you know, the home kitchen garden or um, even like the indigenous gardens or the plantation gardens that uh, an enslaved person might have for themselves and not the one that they're growing for the plantation owner, that might be many layered gardens where they're trying to Mm -hmm. squeeze it all in, right? Trying to get as much together as possible because they have precious little space to be gardening. Yep. Yep. And a lot of times People in the South, we would go and visit relatives in North and South Carolina. A lot of times they might have a whole garden planted on the side of their house, mixed in with other plants because space was at a premium. And they would sweep that front yard. They might have the pigs on one side, but where they grew, the things that mattered, whether it was for beauty or for food, it was all right there together. And there was no mulch. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that is almost, I don't want to say the original small space gardening, but that's mm-hmm. definitely one method of trying to be intensely gardening the little mm-hmm. resources and precious soil you have. So, I mean, that's a luxury, really, to be able to mulch. <laughs> Isn't it the truth? <laughs> to have, like, each each little plant its showcase. And that works for collector gardens. Say you have a rose mm-hmm. garden and each one wants to be shown off individually and you want to have separation between them. But otherwise, you know, layering your plants either from height, from tallest to the back to shortest to the front, like you would in a a traditional English cottage garden or Mm -hmm. layering in a spiral or um, an herb spiral, or you're layering like the three sisters uh, that the native Americans used where you have a tall plant in the middle, a vining plant around it, and then a sprawling plant at its base. You know, that's Mm -hmm. just like our current container formulas where we talk about thriller, chiller, and spiller. Yep. Yep. And we also speak to the art of intensive gardening because gardening is an art form. You know, you you, kind of choose in your opinion, what goes with what, how you're going to do it. Three Sisters Garden, there are recommendations or there's suggested plants that you should try. Think outside the box. Try a different vining bean. Try a Christmas lima bean as opposed to a string bean. You know, you just have to think outside the box and make it your own. So true. And don't grow things that you're not going to eat. How's that? (laughs) I mean, we're giving you permission to, you know, pick the flowers that you want to grow. If you don't love roses, don't grow roses. If you don't eat lima beans, don't grow lima beans just because they're right. easy or somebody else is growing them or gave you the seeds for them. So especially when you, again, have small space and just a little bit of resources to use. Right. Right. It's like a recipe. If you have a recipe for 10 and it's just you, you're going to work it so that it's a manageable size. Even if you cut it in half, manageable size so that you can store some away, but you also, it's it's not so overwhelming to have in the fridge. You know what I mean? So your small space gardening is like gardening for you personally. Look at it that way and choose your plants wisely, whether they're native plants, ornamental plants, or edibles. And I do want to talk about, so you have a dog, Precious, And this is one of the things that I get asked by small space and urban gardeners every once in a while. So you have a limited little, say you have a row house and you basically have a 20 by 20 foot backyard or even front little garden and the dog wants out (laughs) and and you want a garden. How do you do both simultaneously? You direct that path is what you Mm -hmm. do. (laughs) (laughs) You create a pathway and we talk about this in the book. You create a pathway. If you create a pathway, you can easily train a dog to follow that path. And it doesn't have to be an unsightly area where they can 
go and do their thing, so to speak. Put some taller plants in front of it to screen it. Because once you get them going in that area, make it pretty. Make it appealing. Good tips. And I would think that the other concern that a lot of people have, of course, is plants that are safe for your dog. Yeah, you want to make sure that whatever plants you use for screening, like a dog run, or screening an area that uh, you know the dog is going to run back and forth along the fence and play with other dogs. So don't plant there. But you can pretty much guide them to that spot and make sure that what you plant in front of there is not something that they're going to go, oh, I think I'll take a nibble of this, and then they get sick. So you want to do your research to make sure that you're planting things that are not toxic to your animals and utilize those things properly. Mm -hmm. Precious um, has figured out that digging is fun. Mm. So I just created a little area. I don't want to say it's a sandbox because, yes, she is spoiled, but it's not a sandbox. There is sand there, but there's also soil there. And when she goes to that particular area, she can do what she wants. Right now, she's digging a very, very deep tunnel. And before it rains, I usually fill it back in. And then she just goes for it again. But it has created a sacred space for her that she can call her own. And therefore, she leaves the rest of the garden alone. And speaking of leaving the rest of the garden alone, uh, one challenge of small space and urban gardens is creating a sense of privacy, of being able to relax and not feel like everybody is who's passing by is looking in at you you know sometimes if you're an apartment dweller you have people above and below who can see in so let's talk about some of the tips in the book that we share about creating privacy well you can stagger your plant material or create a borrowed view that uh, people see a beautiful garden and you can be right there in it but they're looking at beyond your space and you can be right there. So creating a sense of privacy with a borrowed view, I think is advantageous. I'm in my garden a lot and people don't see me. Um, You can do use fabric for some type of screening Uh, that works. And it also creates this illusion of, I wonder what they're doing back there, but they can't see you. That's a beautiful thing. Yeah. And I was going to say, there's a plot in my community garden, just a couple over from me. And there's a a couple of ladies from Eastern Europe who share the plot and they trade time in it. And they, they are in there almost every day. Like every time I go to community garden, they're, they love it. (laughs) That's, Mm -hmm. that's their place of solace, their place of uh, oasis. But I would say nine times out of the 10, you don't see them in the plot because they're, they're well hidden and they've created a nice little seating area to the back of that little plot where there's a fig tree and just a little stool. And sometimes I'll walk right by within a few feet of them and don't even see that they're there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. If, if that's, if I'm working in my pathway on one side of my house, if I'm working in my pathway, um, you know, trying to rid some of those edge weeds or whatever. When I bend down, because my Rutabecchia triloba is about three feet tall, you you would never know I was in the garden. <laughs> I'm sure you've scared a few people that way. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and you pop up and you're like, hello. Yeah. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about also about expanding your growing space. So we talked about people who have challenges with finding space and and how they might gain a little more. So I won't call it guerrilla gardening, but I'll call it just expanding the boundary of your garden. How's that? Um, So sometimes you can spell out a little bit onto the sidewalk and test how that does. Sometimes you can um, place some containers around where you work and maybe at the entrance there. And then sometimes mm-hmm. you can expand into the tree box or the median strip, or some people call it a hell strip. Um, do you do that, Terry? Are you an expander? Well, let's put it this way. I recently had my, my property surveyed 
and technically there should be a sidewalk in my cul-de-sac but there isn't one it hasn't been one in the 17 years I've been here so my uh meadow goes from the curb to the door <laughs> my I've created pathways in it but yeah, there probably should have been a tree box out there or a hell strip, but yeah, that doesn't exist. <laughs> <laughs> well, I will keep that secret if our listeners will keep that secret. <laughs> Everybody else has grass, mm -hmm. and I watch them mow it religiously, and it's like, wow, that's so nice. But I'm just going to sit here and finish reading my book in the middle of my Rebecca Triloba while you all cut your grass. <laughs> <laughs> when there are lots of really cool products that are being introduced onto the market for small space urban gardeners, for, for people who can't garden maybe because of accessibility issues or mobility issues. So um, how about sharing a few of your favorites, Terry? Raised beds, raised pots, use your window, window sills, window boxes, grow up. You can stack pots or make a column of containers, I'll say. You can even stack cinder blocks and put small things in there. Because you might not have the mobility, um, and as we as we age, what I call the seasoned gardener, you know, you may not be into bending down all the time. Get a scoop. If you still want to grow in the ground, if you don't want to grow in the ground, think about pots. There are so many beautiful containers, trugs on the market nowadays. You can still garden even if you're not maybe as mobile as you used to be. And also <laughs> moving around pathwise, even if you're in a wheelchair, large pots along a path are a great way to still engage with the earth. So I would not let any disability, as they say, discourage anyone from gardening. Where there's a will, there's a way. Garden up, you got it made. And there's a lot of lighter weight things on the markets these days um, that I've noticed. And things are being packaged smaller, which mm -hmm. makes you think, oh, well, I'm paying maybe the same price for less but there is a method to the madness in the marketing. Mm -hmm. So I've noticed that soil bags are a little bit smaller because to make them easier for, I, I'm not going to say the, the age group, we'll just say over 65s. Mm -hmm. <laughs> to They're seasoned. Seasoned gardeners to pick up. Mm -hmm. um, and pot materials are getting lighter. And also, uh, I think you're a big fan and I'm a big fan of the fabric growing bags that you can use now. Oh, I love them. Give me a smart pot any day. Mm -hmm. Seriously. It, it, and the beauty is not just that they're lightweight and portable and colorful now. The beauty is at the end of the season, you dump the soil, brush it out, wash it if you want to, lay it flat and put it away. I mean, I think of all the pots that my parents used to have lined up at the back of the house at the end of the season. And now you wouldn't even have to do that. So true that I remember, you know, some of the old pots that have been collected and they just kind of sit empty or fill up with water throughout the winter time. So mm -hmm. even if you aren't a small space gardener, even if you have tons of space for storage, just makes it so much easier to, to do it in those fabric bags and then mm -hmm. to recycle the soil and start new, especially when you know that you have to switch out the soil for, say, anything in the tomato family. So mm -hmm. if you had eggplants, peppers, potatoes, or tomatoes in that soil, you want to switch out that soil um, completely each year so you, so you don't pass along, of course, any soil-borne um, issues or fungus mm -hmm. or anything like that or early blight or late blight. But of course, you know, I'm not the most ambitious gardener for changing out every container. <laughs> So, you know, I probably in a regular heavy container, you know, 
maybe a 24 inch diameter one, I'm going to maybe switch out a third at the most of the soil season to season when I'm planting it up, you know, fresh in the spring, unless it was one of those vegetable categories. And I, I uh, got rid of a lot of containers last year because I pretty much have switched over to smart pots. I kid you not. It's so much easier for me um, except for my bulbs. Now I do have most of my bulbs in specific, uh, you know, standard pots, but everything else, my annuals that I have overflowing and all they're in smart pots. It's just smarter. <laughs> it's easier. And to me, the plants have turned out better. Do you think one of the advantages is that they get a little more oxygen around their root zone? Yeah, they get more because they basically will will self prune their own roots by being in these containers because of the air circulating around them. Uh, but also, you know, the sun does shift throughout the season. With a smart pot, you know, if you put something in the wrong space or it got real hot and you moved it to a shady area, it's easy to move it back out. Very very lightweight. It's to me, it's perfect. For the young gardener, it's perfect for children. It's perfect for the busy on-the-go gardener that, oh, I forgot to move that pot. Well, that's easy to lift as opposed to, because most of them come with handles, as opposed to a generic pot that you have to physically move it. And then for our seasoned gardeners, it's just the way to go. Besides vegetables, you're planting flowers, shrubs. What do you what else do you have in your fabric bag? Um, I've got roses in my fabric bags. Uh, I've got, um, I'm try, try, trialing uh, three different plants and they're all stunning. I have one big uh, bag of heliotrope because I love heliotrope. Mm -hmm. um, I've got all, I keep a salad bag going because I can tuck the salad bag behind my hydrangeas because right now it's a little warm for them. For the salad, but if you tuck it behind something, once again, a lightweight bag, tuck it in, boom. I'm still harvesting lettuce. And herbs too, of course. Yeah, my herbs I have in, um, I've got these two raised uh, beds on either side of my terrace door and they have shade cloth and they have plastic because I use them for year round growing. So all of my herbs are in there so that they're accessible for me. So, but you can grow herbs in fabric pots, but mine are in that raised, in the raised beds. I was going to ask about containers on wheels next. <laughs> when We were talking about <laughs> mobility and, and moving heavy things. Um, because I think a lot of people, when they think about containers, don't think about the fact that they are mobile, whether they have wheels on them or not. And like you said, you can move them to more shade to protect your lettuces as the season heats up. And of course, push them into more sun as the sun starts to drop at the angle in the sky over the season. Right, right. And if your pot does not have wheels, it's easy to make a little caddy and put them on wheels, especially your tropicals. Um, it just occurred to me, Kathy, I do have Brugmansia. I've got three of them in fabric bags. Why? Because I'm going to be bringing them in. Mm -hmm. Easier, to, much so much easier in the past. I've had them in these beautiful, you know, ceramic decorative containers. And I would dread September when I kind of be shifting them closer to the terrace door. I don't have to worry about that now. Now, as they get bigger, I might have to rethink that. But right now, they're perfect. So I could put, even put the uh, fabric pot on a dolly and move that around so that my brooks will get enough sun. Mm -hmm. I've even seen people put them in milk crates. So they're kind of sitting up above to increase the drainage on the bottom. Because sometimes that's the one detriment, I think, for some of the fabric bags is when they're sitting flush on the ground. Mm -hmm. um, they can get a little bit moldy or can start growing things underneath just because the way the water collects. So it needs mm -hmm. a little bit better drainage if you can lift them up a, a tiny bit, maybe on you know, pot feet or a couple stones or something. Mm -hmm. One 
a use of fabric pots that had not even occurred to me until I saw it in somebody else's garden was for their water garden plants. And I was shocked because oh. I thought of, you know, fabric bags as they last about three seasons or so uh, yeah. before they start to get a little worn and you can get maybe some more use out of them. But they actually work phenomenally for potting up a water lily root or other type of marginal plant and sticking it in and being light and being a thin fabric is just a perfect solution instead of having those like you can kind of see them through the surface of the pond and look down and see the edges of your black plastic pots because you obviously you want them to blend in as much as possible right huh that that is a good thought i never thought about it for using in water good point i know and it just stays submerged and they stay <laughs> which is yeah. which is pretty cool so one more extra tip for the for those fabric bags that you might have so mm-hmm. as we're wrapping up i wanted to ask how listeners can follow you on social media how they can get in touch with you well now that we're <laughs> we've submitted our manuscript <laughs> i can get back on social media <laughs> On Facebook, I'm Cottage in the Court. Instagram and Twitter, Cottage in Court. And sometimes if I have things I really got to get off my chest, I write on Medium. And uh, feel free to email me at terry at cottageinthecourt.com. And that's T-E-R-I. And thanks for spelling that. And for those who listeners who can't access the the podcast notes, her last name is spelled S P E I. G H T. Yes. And I also have a podcast, Kathy. <laughs> yes. I was going to say, you forgot to mention something, Terry, that uh, our listeners might be interested in because once you listen to one pat podcast, right, you tend to listen to more. Yeah. And I, my podcast is, you know, there are so many people that I want to meet and interact with around the world. So my podcast features guests hither and yon. Um, I have fun with this gardening bug that I have, uh, been bitten by. I wouldn't trade it for the world. Um, there's so many real people out there that garden and we need to get to know them. And even the professionals that garden, they're real people too. So, you know, hearing from them in their own words about a book they wrote or a place that they went to or their favorite flower. It's absolutely amazing. So uh, my podcast is also Cottage in the Court and it's on Anchor. Well, thank you, Terry, for sharing the journey of book writing with me. (laughs) (laughs) It certainly made it a lot easier for both of our first books to be co-written. And I'm thankful also that we're on each side of the DC Beltway. So we're close by in... uh, not just our location, but also our Mm -hmm. philosophy on gardening and our interest in gardening. We're both, I'm going to describe us as both frugal gardeners, right, Terry? Yeah. And uh, we don't like to waste our time and resources, but we also want to maximize what we get out of our gardens. I think we're innovative too, Mm -hmm. Kat. That's true. And I also think that you, especially what I'm going to describe as myself too, we are proselytizers of gardening. (laughs) We we are like pushers of the gardening drug and we want more people to be out there gardening. Not that there's not tons of people gardening, but there can always be more, right? There can always be more. And I can I just share two things I really want people to think about as they are either continuing or beginning their garden journey. Um, Use your own yard to feed your own garden. And I say that because so many people consider yard waste, you you put it in a brown bag and you put it by the curb. That's your compost. Your garden made that food. Feed your garden. That's number one. Number two, It's a life philosophy of mine, but it definitely applies to gardeners. Whether you're a seasoned gardener, a new gardener, thinking about being a gardener, just be kind 
everyone is not on the same gardening level as you are. Meet people where they are on their garden journey. If you're seasoned, share those tips, share that advice. If you're new to it, ask the question. They, there is an answer. Ask the question. And if you're thinking about gardening, keep sticking around other people that garden. The bug will bite you. <laughs> <laughs> Great advice. Thank you, Terry. You're welcome. Lily plant profile. Lilies, Lilium species, are a perennial bulb that produce a dramatic flower on tall stems. There are many varieties of true lilies, from the Asiatic lily, the Longiflorum lily, also known as Easter lilies, the Oriental lily, and all kinds of crosses between these three types. These include hybrids that are double lilies, odorless lilies, and pollen-free lilies. Most lilies are native to Asia and Europe, but there are three kinds of true lilies that are native to the northeastern United States. They are the wood lily, Canada lily, and the Turks cap lily. Lilies are easy to grow and extremely rewarding. They make great cut flowers and combine well in garden bins with other perennial plants. Plant lily bulbs as soon after you purchase them as possible in springtime for summer blooms. When you can't plant your lily bulbs right away, store them in a cool, dark place, such as in the refrigerator. This will keep the shoots from emerging too soon. Put the lily bulbs in the ground six inches deep and 12 inches apart. Place them gently into the soil without pressing on them, then cover the flower bulbs with soil. As soon as the summer bulbs have been planted, give them a thorough watering to encourage their roots to develop quickly. Lilies also do well in containers, as long as the pots are sufficiently deep and have good drainage. One benefit of growing lilies in pots is that they can be brought forward right when the flowers are about to open and tucked away when out of bloom. Lilies in containers also require extra fertilizer and have to be watered frequently so they do not dry out. After flowering, snip off the spent lily flowers but leave most of the stems standing to allow the plants to collect energy and return for you year after year. Lilies, you can grow that. What's new in the garden this week? Well, here in my home garden, the floating pond plants, water lettuce and water hyacinth, have exploded into many colonies, and now I'm thinning them out and sharing them with some of my friends who have their own water gardens. The summer shrubs are putting on a beautiful show, from vitex to abelia to mop head hydrangea to the just emerging crepe myrtles. They are bridging the season beautifully, and in the perennial border, the Echinacea and Rudbeckia are putting on their own show, while Menarda has just finished, as have the Yarrow. In the local gardening world, Kenilworth Aquatic Gardens in Washington, D.C. normally has their annual festival this weekend. Instead, it will be virtual, combined with some in-person events. So check out the Friends of Kenilworth Gardens page for some of the event listings, visit the gardens on your own, and also take place in some of those fun virtual events that are scheduled this year. Also happening locally is the annual sunflower fields at McKee Besher's Wildlife Management Area in Western Montgomery County, Maryland. So these were planted by the state of Maryland every summer. Fields of sunflowers for feeding and attracting migratory game birds. It is a hunting preserve, but photographers, flower lovers, and art clubs flock to it in July because the sunflowers go on and on and on. So it's a 2,000 acre area located off of River Road, just outside of Seneca, Maryland, between Potomac and Poolsville. And you can look out for the signs for sunflowers. You can also go online and check the local photography clubs and they'll let you know when the sunflowers are at their peak. And bring your camera, bring a friend, enjoy the sunflowers. It's a wonderful sight to see. Happy gardening.
Thank you for listening to Garden DC. You can become a listener supporter for as little as 99 cents a month by going to anchor.fm slash garden DC slash support. Another way to support this podcast is to subscribe to our monthly digital publication, Washington Gardener Magazine. To do so, go to washingtongardener.com. Thank you. You can find Washington Gardener online at washingtongardener.com, on Twitter at WDC Gardener, on Instagram at WDC Gardener, and on Facebook.com at Washington Gardener Magazine.